live stream this meeting. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I think my connection is unstable. Is it okay now? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's very clear, Bu Rana. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, excuse me, Maurits, can you please start the live stream now? Okay. Thank you. Recording in progress. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Raras Maya, and I am the lecturer from Department of Information System ITS, and I will be the moderator for today's event. We are welcoming all of the participants of the second session of Ajang Professor Program 2022. This event is held by the Department of Information Systems, Faculty of Intelligent Electrical and Informatics Technology, FTEIC, Institute Technology 10 November ITS. The topic of this year program is about IoT enabled services. With the specific topic of today's session is about IoT applications with data and analytics. We would also like to welcome Professor So Yancho from the National Taiwan University of Science and Technology, NTUST Taiwan, as the speaker of this event. Welcome, Prof. Cho. We are very honored to have you here. Thank you. Very happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Okay, so these are the objectives of a young professor program. The objectives of a young professor program is to activate an international academic atmosphere in the ITS environment, to activate the culture of international publication, and increase the number of ITS international lecturers, and also increase the ITS reputation in the world. Actually, Department of Information System ITS has already held a jump professor program since 2021 with the same topics, which is about IoT-enabled services. And the recording of this session, this program, and the previous adjunct professor program can be seen on the YouTube channel of Department Information System, which is System Informasi ITS. The IoT connects the digital and physical words by collecting, measuring, and analyzing data to predict and automate business process. This adjunct professor program will give you a foundation in the IoT. Including the, uh, including the component, tools, and analysis by teaching the concept behind the IoT and a look at a real-world solution. The learning objective of this program is to understand the definition and significance of the IoT, discuss the architecture, operation, and business benefit of an IoT solution, explore the relationship between IoT and digital transformation, and able to understand the application areas of IoT and examine the potential real-world opportunities that IoT can uncover. And this year, a young professor will be delivered on four sessions in which this is the second session of this program. In the previous session, we already talked about the fundamentals of IoT. And today, we will learn about IoT applications that related with data and analytics. In this session, we will also have a demo that will be delivered by Prof. Cho's laboratory members. Okay, before we start the session, here is the rules for this meeting. Please use full name in the Zoom meeting, turn on your video, use the virtual background, and fill the presence. And then you can write your question in Zoom chat, or you can also raise hand uh, in the Q&A session. Certificate of attendance are available for participants who joined all of the four sessions. And another certificate will be added for participants who pass the evaluation at the end of the session, at the end of the four sessions. And the link for present form, syllabus, and virtual backgrounds will be sent in the Zoom chat letter. 
And this is the schedule for today's session. The first agenda is opening speech by the coordinator of Ajang Professor Program 2022, Prof. Erma Suryani. Welcome, Prof. Would you like to give a short okay. speech for this session? Okay, thank you, Buraras. Yeah, good afternoon, Professor Jo. Yeah, Mas Indi. Yeah, thank you very much because of your support. We can organize this program. Yeah, and today uh, we are coming into the second. Yeah, with the title that already mentioned by Buraras. Yeah. I hope this program will bring a fruitful benefit for all of us. Thank you, Buraras. I will return this session to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Erma. Yeah. Okay. Next, we will move to the lecture by Prof. Jo that will be delivered for about one hour. And then there will be some demo from Prof. Joe's lab member for about half an hour. And after that, we will have a Q&A session at the, end of the, on, at the end of this event. This session will be end at about 5 p.m. in Western Indonesian time. Before we start, let me introduce our honored speaker first. Professor Suyan Cho is a Distinguished Professor and Director of Center for Internet I IoT Innovation in NTUST, Taiwan. Uh, Prof. Cho obtained his PhD in Industrial and Operation Engineering, University of Michigan, and Arbor, Michigan. Okay. And then his research interest is about IoT innovation, industrial IoT, big data analytics, AI, smart city application, blockchain application, intelligent transformation, transportation system, entrepreneurship, decision theory, digital manufacturing, and computational geometry. Uh, you can find more details at his website on ntusd.edu.tw. Okay, very interesting, isn't it? So let's start the lec uh, this lecture session. Please welcome Professor Cho. Professor Cho, the time is yours. Hello, Professor. Can you unmute your Zoom? Uh, I'm sorry, Prof. Jo, you forget to unmute your Zoom. Unmute? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Then, let me then share my slide. Yes. Slide show. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully you can see me. Yeah. See my slide. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So uh, again, thank you for the uh, introduction and thank you for hosting the, uh, this talk. Um, uh, I also noticed that uh, previously uh, the, the fourth session uh, was planned to be held on May 24th. It has been updated to uh, May 25th yes. for those of you who uh, who are here last time, uh, please be aware that the last session will be on May 25th. On yes. uh, that day, I will be in London. So I will be joining you from, from London. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, so sorry for the, for the change. Uh, I thought that um, it was uh, like it was before that I can select a day to travel, but it turns out that there were very few flights uh, to <laughs> To, to, to uh, buy from Taiwan to Europe. So, so my flight uh, has, has to be changed. So let me continue on the, uh, the, the presentation. Uh, oh, sorry. Let me maybe move up, move to the, the page. So last week, uh, 
uh, last time that we had a session, uh, basically I was trying to introduce you uh, the history, uh, the relevant technologies and very basic idea of IoT. And I was trying to emphasize uh, the scope of the architecture. Uh, I think a lot of people think of IoT, think of it uh, in a very uh, fragmented way. So I was talking about different elements and talking about the technologies that integrate IoT together. And IoT basically, based on what I introduced last week, seems to be just uh, hardware or software uh, connecting things, physical things with the, with the digital world. And of course, uh, last week I have already emphasized that it is extremely important because in order to manage the physical world well, we need to understand what is going on in the physical world. And if we don't record the data and we, we don't understand how things happen in the physical world, it, it will be very difficult for us to manage the complexity, uh, the, the complex world. So that's the, the purpose of IoT. And today I, I'm going to um, emphasize more on the data collected by IoT infrastructure and how we can analyze it. So data collected by or connecting the physical world, getting data from the object itself or from the, for the environment. And those data are equally important to the data that we collected online from people's uh, online behavior. I remember last time I emphasized that online business are now the dominant business in the world because they understand users. They have access to users or customers. So they created, they have created tremendous amount of value uh, in the business world. Similarly, I think gradually uh, being able to uh, manage the data collected from the physical world and device uh, measure, device solution for the physical world problem will create significant value as well. Of course, physical world and digital world will gradually uh, will be gradually integrated together. And as the digital world continue to evolve, and I think uh, we'll see a very interesting development in the future. Maybe it is a uh, part of so-called metaverse. Maybe it, it is something else, but uh, we'll, we'll also spend some time to look at it uh, next time. In order to uh, analyze the data collected from, from uh, IoT, I think tra traditionally we have heard of data mining. We have heard of uh, maybe also machine learning. I think in, in the recent years, uh, because of deep, le deep learning, which help us to, uh, to convert a lot of unstructured data into structured data, further allow us to do the analytics better. So that's, uh, these are the points that I'm going to uh, go through today. So maybe let's backtrack to one slide, which I did not, uh, did not explain last week. This is a coffee maker. I think people under, understand. Uh, excuse me, Prof. Joe, yes. do you share some screen? Because we're still looking at the uh, yeah. presentation view, not in the presentation. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Let me, okay, okay, sorry. How about now? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. That's good. So, So uh, this is a coffee maker, you probably understand, right? So for a coffee maker, although this is very, very fancy one, so uh, it has, it probably has a lot of function that I'm, I'm going to talk about. But for a coffee maker, just like any uh, traditional machine or tangible item, it is mechanical. It performs certain tasks, but it provides very little information and provide uh, and has very minimum connectivity with the rest of the world. So you will be a human usually operating on the machine and providing whatever outcome uh, coming out with the machine. So coffee maker, of course, it make coffee, different kind of coffee, 
with the mechanical design, you will create different kind of coffee. Then if I ask you, if the coffee machine has some digital capability, being able to sense, communicate, connected with the outside world, utilize the, the base uh, functions on the web. Can you think of any other functions or service that this coffee machine can possess and improve on its service, improve on its value and so on? I think if I give it, uh, give this as a, a homework, then I think a lot of you will come up with very interesting idea. Basically with a machine in the past, when machine break, it breaks. But then with the sensors, in fact, we can do uh, later, we, we'll talk about a lot of these points again. Uh, later, uh, now with the sensor, in fact, we can do something called predicting maintenance. We can observe its uh, operating uh, conditions and predict uh, or intervene of the breakdown right before it breaks. Or we can uh, basically monitor, for example, the consumption of coffee beans, consumption of some uh, consumable items. Then when we need to replace them, the, the, the coffee machine can automatically send the request and have it or have them deliver to you or to the store. And per, uh, in the past, for this uh, coffee machine, it is just a machine. It is a mechanical machine. And we basically has very minimum control of this machine. Hopefully it will perform a great job right from the beginning. But if there's something different, something very complex, something that needs to be changed, there's nothing that we can do. But with the digital function or uh, with the uh, connectivity with the the network, basically we can optimize the performance. For example, you want to create a certain kind of coffee uh, or, and it has its recipe. It can provide that control the bean, control the temperature, control the speed of water flowing through, can control the, the granularity of the coffee powder and so on, creating a much better uh, co uh, coffee for individual or tailor or to individual's taste. So it has a lot of power. You can use a, a machine, not as a machine that you purchase. You can pay as you use. You don't need to pay for the, uh, an expensive machine, just depending on how many uh, coffee that you, you take uh, from the coffee machine, you pay for the amount. And because uh, they may, be a lot of recipe for making different kinds of uh, coffee. And basically you can also put those formula as a software, right? Different people can create based on their understanding of how the coffee, certain coffee should be made. And they can sell such kind of software to different kinds of different coffee machines so that your software, your understanding of, uh, uh, of how to make a certain coffee become a revenue stream. So, so with the physical machine, having digital capability, being able to connect, uh, having sensors so that they know uh, how to adapt and adjust and also connect online so that they can utilize the digital power this machine becomes a very powerful machine and can generate a great number of possible business model and new innovation. Okay, so this is just an example that with the data that we can collect, analyze, and, and the connectivity of getting more software coming in directly or getting analysis on the cloud, we will be able to generate a lot of new business model rather than just making a machine as a product and allowing user to operate and we don't know what's going on and we, we have no contact. We cannot interact with the, the, uh, the users of the machine anymore.
So it does change the business model tremendously. Although we are talking about connecting with the machine, but in fact, we are connecting the users. We are connecting with the environment surrounding the machine. So the impact is a lot more than, oh yeah, we are connecting. We have a sensor, we connect the machine. Okay, we don't know what to do. In fact, there are a lot of things that over the past, um, I think close to 15 years, more than 15 years already, uh, a lot of new uh, ideas have been implemented and tested. So let's move on to uh, uh, different application. I think all of you know uh, e-commerce very well already. With the e-commerce company, uh, here is a, an example. With physical company such as Sears or uh, some companies specifically selling this microwave, uh, for example, Best Buy, for Sears, they set the price of the microwave and the price will stay there unless there's an event, right? So if you look at this, this is the course of a day. The semi-circle is the course of a day. For Sears, the price stay the same, which is the blue one. For Best Buy, the curve is the green curve. So for Best Buy, because they are very much focused on this specific uh, uh, electric uh, appliances. So they know uh, for their customer, maybe for certain duration, uh, here you can see that uh, uh, from five to, to around uh, 7.30, eight o'clock, uh, maybe a lot of uh, housewife or people going home will buy the machine, they raise the price. And during other time, maybe housewife will, will try to buy them and they are more sensitive to the price. The price will be lower. But for the red curve, which is Amazon's uh, selling price, over the course of the day, Amazon can have seven, eight times price change they analyze their customer in greater detail, understand at which time period, what kind of customers will be uh, online making purchase. Some customers are not are very sensitive to the price, so they keep the price low. Some customers are insensitive to the price and they have time for them has even higher value. So Amazon raised the price. So you can see that during the course of the day, doing this so-called dynamic pricing, which was used for airline companies, but their dynamic pricing is very, very uh, coarse granularity of the time. But Amazon, within one day, they can change the price so much to increase the likelihood of having more customer buying their product and also profit from the increase of the revenue. This is very different from other models. When you have one price, you try to, we all know that price and quantity based on very basic economics, price and, price and quantity has this inverse relationship, higher price, lower quantity. But you, if you can change the price, you can increase the revenue. It's called revenue management. The dynamic pricing has been used for uh, airline companies and other companies uh, a lot. But those kinds of dynamic pricing was very rough, very coarse. And Amazon is doing this on a daily basis. How can Amazon do this? I think all of you should, should have known that it's because you provide the information, all the customer provide the information. Customer know, uh, Amazon know their customer, analyze their customer to the degree that Amazon can devise such kinds, such kind of pricing scheme to improve their sales, revenue, number of uh, purchases, and also set different prices and 
try to optimize their revenue and profit. So this is very powerful tool. Understanding customer and trying to target on different customer, that different sector of the customer. So that if you remember calculus, like you cut it into a smaller piece, you accumulate them together, you increase the area covered. So how can we compete? It's very difficult. However, there's a new space that is in the physical world. We know very little about our, our customer, but in the physical world, knowing customer is equally important. Customer do not, I mean, just take myself as an example. I don't buy things online, seldom buy things online. I, I bought uh, tickets, maybe hotel. Uh, there's no, no other way for me to, to get them. But for a lot of uh, items, I bought them in the, from the physical store. I go to uh, say convenience store, well, many convenience store. How can they know me? And how can they do say cross out on me? So basically in the physical world, in order to do that, we need to sense, get the information from the customer so that we can uh, devise different kinds of uh, skin for the customers. In fact, there are, uh, if you have the slide, in the slide, in the notes part, I put a lot of uh, application there. You can read them, it's very easy to understand. We can play game with them. We can do this uh, geo, uh, geo target um, uh, marketing with uh, with the uh, retail within the, the range. Uh, we can understand a lot of information about customer in the physical world so that we can target them to do cross sell, upsell. Oh, yeah, we can ask them to vote positively or negatively. And we can collect those information. In the past, it was very difficult. Now, everybody has their own device. Everybody can be tracked. Everybody can connect with you online. So we can try to obtain those information so that on one hand, we can better serve our customer. On the other hand, we can improve our, our competitiveness by knowing our customer better than what other companies or what other store can do so that we can profit from this or we can compete better. Uh, this is a very, very simple way. Uh, for example, there was a campaign, very simple campaign. Oh, uh, every hour you can press uh, a button indicating that you are very close to, to the restaurant. So, but every, every hour you can only press one time. So at the end of the week, we will see which one has the highest uh, number of the <clears throat> the clicks. And this is done by a Japanese, uh, um, a, an Italian restaurant in Japan. So it's Japanese Italian restaurant. Okay. And basically the person who uh, has the highest number of click will get vouchers so that the, the person can go. So how does that help? What kind of information uh, does the uh, restaurant try, try, try to get? And how would that how their business. In fact, for a person who will participate in the game, first of all, the person needs to have interest, like to have, say, pizza. And the free, the person can click on it, meaning that the, place, the person need to be quite close. Otherwise, it's very difficult to go there. Even if the person uh, is in some close uh, area, the person needs to go there quite frequently. So basically by clicking more number, at least we screen out a lot of customer who just accidentally go pass by the store and say, oh, I get a coupon. I went in to uh, have a, a pizza, free pizza, then I never go there. At least, at least this person or some other people like this will be uh, your target customer because they are close by your restaurant and having interest and may go, go by the, go by the place quite often. Okay, so that, that is just an example that you can collect a lot of data from the customer, from the user, so that you can devise uh, 
a more targeted campaign rather than a mass uh, marketing, like sent to millions of people, but only 0.01% of customer was affected. So you are wasting a lot of money. Now we allow them to connect to us, telling us uh, their behavior. Then we can target on the one which is to our advantage and, and do our marketing towards them. Okay, so that's also a very early, maybe 10 years, maybe even 15 years ago, a campaign did in Japan, which was very effective and very interesting. And this is something uh, like concept design that we did a uh, long time ago. It was uh, basically in, uh, uh, it was um, requested by uh, General Motors, uh, their dealership. They want to understand their, their customers better. You know, their customer came in, uh, walk around, checking on different, different vehicles, but their salespeople may not be as sufficient. So when the salesperson dealing with one customer and later want to deal with this other customer, then this sales has uh, had no information on this customer. The, the, the sales needs to spend a lot of time communicating with the customer in order to get information before can, can oh, okay, maybe I should, I should push you to buy this and that. Maybe, maybe this customer doesn't like this, this, this color or this kind of vehicle or may want to have a small car or big car and so on. The sales doesn't know it. The sales needs to go through the process to understand the customer before the sales can, can do any, anything. And sometimes you are dealing with a customer who has no intention to buy your car and you missed, uh, uh, you did not take care of the customer who is really interested in getting a car and the customer left because the customer did not have service. So that's the problem that they have. So they want us to put sensors Oh, first of all, we need to track the customer, where they are and how much time they spend and the way they walk around and so on. So that we can, when we can monitor all the people inside the dealership and maybe giving score, allowing salespeople knowing which person has already been us evaluated as a very potential buyer and what this person likes because the person has come back to the same car many times or standing there for a long time maybe going through the wi-fi that we 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 provide them uh, although we, we do not take their information but the person seems to be searching a lot of information searching our website and so on so that combining the online information and offline information when we when the salesperson approach the uh the potential customer, the salesperson knows a lot about the customer already, and the salesperson will approach those customers who have higher intention of purchasing the car. Okay, and th this idea, in fact, we got it from from um, uh, when we were doing um, data mining. So a customer went to a bank trying to open the account. And uh, people in the bank will try to sell this, this customer a different kind of financial products, spending a lot of time. And other customers were waiting for a long time. Some uh, had no patience and left. What they should do is when customer filled up some basic information, they have, oh, in fact, they have already done that. And we did some analysis for them. So, we ask the customer to fill in some basic information. And once the customer fill in that very basic information, very minimal information, we have already classified them as like, from top to bottom, like which level, how likely you can promote them a uh, new financial product. If they, are, they have very low score, then the clerk will just say, okay, okay, thank you for your application, bye-bye and send the, the person away. But if this person has very likelihood to, 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 to purchase um, a new financial product, then the clerk will spend time, valuable time on the customer, trying to get the customer to acquire uh, different financial products. So from that model, 
to this model, which we need to understand, we we under we we uh, uh, monitor uh, a person's physical uh, activity in a known environment, and combining such information, build up our understanding of the customer and provide the information to the sales personnel so that they can perform their job more effectively. It's also quite quite interesting, and we did that did the same thing for the um, uh, uh, exhibition, uh, having many, many booths there. And in the end, the, the exhibitor collect like 200, 300 business card and uh, do, do not know where to, who to contact and who is more likely to be their customer. So we also track those people who are in the, uh, we participate the uh, exhibition, understanding how likely they are there. There is a customer or not? Are they just uh, a tourist walking around, or are they jumping between different uh, company who have uh, similar product? If that is the case, they, maybe this person is more likely to be our customer. So um, the company will contact this person first, and going down the list find the most likely all the way down, right? So their time will be better used. So that's another example. So knowing the, lo the location of human uh, in, 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 in retail business, in, um, in commerce is very important. And of course we have uh, cases such as um, Zara having their clerk in the store recording their customer behavior watching the customer, oh, this customer is uh, checking out certain clothes. Ah, this customer, customer doesn't seem to like it. Oh, this customer, this, uh, uh, and basically, other than sales information, some clothes got sold, some clothes did not get sold, sold, they get a lot of information on the floor, observing customers, right? It's uh, so, so that they can quickly decide, um, whether or not they want to, to change the clothes and change it in, in certain way. They fit this information back to their, their company to help their, their designer uh, or their, um, uh, their decision maker to know how to turn the, uh, the clothes um, or change, change the uh, new products so that they can increase their sales. So they track, they have their clerk, doing this uh, sensing jobs. Uh, in the future, maybe we can use camera to do that. In fact, this is what, uh, as of now, is happening. But in the past, uh, for Zara, it's still based on the clerk recording such kind of information. So understanding customers, very similar to the uh, automobile uh, dealership uh, example. And if we want to look beyond retail, I think there are also a lot of examples. One is, I think most powerful to me is knowing when the bus will arrive. It's very simple. You just have a GPS system on the bus and recording its location and providing such information so that every time, because uh, in the school, my office uh, to the bus stop, if I run, it's only one minute. If I walk slowly, it's two minutes. As soon as I, as I know that the bus will come in, say, five minutes, I can casually walk to there and get on the bus to whatever place that I want to go. So bus uh, service is a mass-produced service. You have to, to meet the, the bus schedule. But because I know where it is, for me, there's almost no wait. It's, it's still slower, but it's more like getting out and catch a taxi and to the destination. I don't need to have this anxiety of, mm, if I go there, maybe I need to wait for 20 minutes. Should I go like 25 minutes before, uh, before I should? Because I am not sure whether or not I, I can catch a bus. So for me, it's, I, I, I think for a lot of people, it helped tremendously. In Taipei, this is already a very, very important uh, service. It's very accurate. In fact, I still have a student trying to predict more accurately 
bus arrival time. For the short distance, right? The bus is one, one stop or two stop uh, ahead, uh, away. We can predict it relatively easily. But if the bus is say 10 stop away, then my decision will be, uh, should I go by other ways or should I wait? And how much time it's going to take? Sometimes it's very fast, sometimes it's very slow. So we, um, my students also collect a lot of open data from the city government and use them and doing analysis and making prediction and try to predict or try to better predict bus arrival time. Again, it's just very basic IoT application. Or, or parking, you can imagine, in parking lot, finding your car, or driving to a certain place, whether or not there are still parking spaces, whether or not we have the ability to predict how many parking spaces will remain uh, after you, you drive for 20 minutes. Right? So all these things with the data, we can better manage, should I drive or should I not drive? Okay, that's very also very important for, for uh, city transportation. Or uh, the lower left, this is called smart pillbox. It was uh, designed many years ago, again, I think close to 15 years ago. Uh, th these are the physical prototypes that they made. It's a pillbox, you can, you can, probably understand pill box. I think I have pill box here too, but my pill box is just a box. I just opened it and, and eat. These pill box are connected online. So whenever you open the, open the compartment, the information will be recorded. So you can imagine uh, how this will help. When you go to a doctor, the doctor says, oh, okay, um, your condition is still not good. Maybe I should increase your dosage. But in, in fact, either you did not take the medicine or you did not follow the schedule to take the medicine. That was, those were the reason that uh, your condition was not improved. But the doctor may not know that and you may not want to tell the doctor this. So you are sort of gaming with the doctor. Doctor said, mm, okay, I should increase the dosage. Then you thought, hmm, in fact, I did not take the medicine. Maybe I shouldn't take so much medicine. So it's, uh, it's, there's this, because of this problem is very imprecise for individual. But with the, this uh, a smart pill box, every time you open up, assuming that you are not gaming with the system, chances are that's around, uh, doesn't have to be very precise. Around that time, you will take the medicine. So all the information will be recorded and when you revisit the doctor, doctor has all the information, maybe uh, all the information have been analyzed. Doctor said, okay, based on your conformance to, to the schedule, in fact, the effect of the treatment was probably only 30% or only 60%. So based on this information, hmm, maybe, maybe I think that the medicine will still be effective if you follow the schedule to take the medicine. Although your condition, seem to be a little bit worse. Okay, so, so despite uh, your feeling or my feeling that, oh, we visit the doctor and we see the doctor one by one. So, mm, so medical service is a customized service, personalized service. But if you think of what I just said, it's not. You just go there, test you, good or bad, and without any other information. And it is mass produced services. Unless you can provide all the relevant information to the doctor so that the doctor can treat you precisely as, as, as uh, your conditions are, then it becomes personalized. So pill box, sensors, activity records, all these information, if we can provide them to a doctor, we can even do preventive medicine. Right? We can even try to prevent you from uh, getting certain prop, getting into certain problem is very important. Wow. Right? 
So it is even more effective and less costly. I think nowadays with uh, such kind of uh, IoT technology, in, in fact, in the medical world, they were focusing and pushing a lot on preventive medicine rather than uh, treatment. You have disease, then you treat them and back to normal. Why not try to avoid getting ill, getting sick, getting unwell? Okay, so there are a lot of examples that you can imagine. And transportation, you can consider bus going through the the uh, traffic light. If traffic light delay them, or bus has high priority, so the traffic light can change. Of, of course, uh, ambulance is always a problem. How can we coordinate the traffic so that the ambulance can travel faster without uh, reducing the danger of co collision, reaching the hospital uh, faster? Or uh, I think uh, you see a, a, a drone there. It's also uh, an innovation in Taiwan where there's an accident, the drone will fly above the accident site, taking pictures from the top and extracting features computing the uh, the distance and uh, uh, identify all the pieces and so on, convert them into a table with picture and allowing the traffic to, uh, removing the, the accident, uh, those, those vehicles, colliding vehicles, allow, allow the, the, uh, the traffic to go through again. So with a drum, rather than a policeman, recording measurement, measuring for a long time uh, with a drone, it can significantly reduce the uh, uh, interruption of the traffic. And it has been implemented and it has been shown with the uh, effect. But flying drone right now is a very difficult issue. So it's not um, uh, used popularly. It, it has been proved, but it's not easy to, to, to Im Im implement it comprehensively in Taipei because we don't have the regulation of uh, detail enough regulation on flying drones in the city. And a big uh, uh, push of the, the development is uh, elect electric vehicle. Vehicle, we think them as, as mechanical, but with electric vehicle, with driverless vehicle, in fact, vehicle is no longer controlled by those traditional car companies, right? Here you see uh, Toyota is a very successful traditional car company. You see Tesla coming from nowhere. Now they, are, they have higher market cap than Toyota. Amazon, they have car. It's a retail selling, selling, uh, everything, but it's a retail selling product. They suddenly make cars. Google, they make cars. Apple, they make cars. Uh, Foxconn in Taiwan, they do assembly for, they do a so-called electronic manufacturing service, assemble Apple smartphone for Apple. Now they have a uh, so-called MIH and basically, they just need to have motor, electronic system, electronic system, and the framework. And basically they can, uh, of course, battery. Then they can make a car. They don't need to have the knowledge on say combustion engine. This is the most crit critical part of a traditional vehicle. So in the future, we'll see almost a, any country, any country will be able to build their own car. So MIH, uh, uh, the company in Taiwan, uh, Foxconn in Taiwan was providing this platform, ho hoping that they can, they can help a lot of country building up their own electric vehicles. And in this game, this competition was going to win out. Toyota, we don't know. Toyota is very good company. But Toyota, based on their own assessment, their electronic is probably far behind Tesla. Is Tesla dominating the market? Think of the 
digital player, including Amazon, Google, particularly Apple. There are so many applications that Apple has. Maybe Apple will dominate the market. So again, with IoT, with the ability, uh, with imposing this um, electronic and connectivity on vehicle, there are many innovation can be created. Uh, many new companies can be created. And connective vehicle is not, is not just a car, mobility car. It has many capability, uh, to name a few. Uh, the car can bring you home, finding its own way, the best way, right? Based on the scenery, based on the traffic, based on uh, energy consumption, right? Uh, the car is self-sufficient. If it, it, it's a electric car, the car needs to know where they are uh, 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 electric uh, stations so that they can, they can charge and so on. The, the car itself becomes a very new, um, new, new, new elements in our life. It's not something we drive to the destination for the mobility purpose. It serves many purposes, entertainment for sure, right? Collecting all kinds of data internally or externally. And there are many new business models because time limit, I'm, I'm going, not going to talk about it. It can be on, on insurance, an insurance company knowing how you drive your car based on OBD on board diagnostic system on your car, knowing how you turn, how you step on the pedal, how you accelerate and how you turn and so on. The insurance company can assess individual based on their driving behavior for different uh, insurance fee or insurance company in order to reduce the, the risk of having collision insurance company can intervene in real time providing you certain discount if you change your driving behavior and many other things. Uh, from transportation, we can also look at uh, energy. Right? Energy, we can basically using smartphone to communicate individual. Uh, this is something we have been doing and hopefully we'll continue this de development uh, for a long time. It is about changing people's uh, energy consumption behavior so that uh, the highway itself, we can try to, the building, we can try to make it an energy efficient building. We can have many uh, like different uh, lighting, uh, energy efficient uh, air conditioner. Uh, we, can, we can do a lot of smart things, motion uh, sensing uh, uh, system and so on. But we need to also change people's behavior. So with smartphone, with the sensors, we'll be able to feedback information to the user. Hopefully by doing so, we can change user's behavior on energy consumption. And uh, in the recent year, the biggest uh, impact on our energy industry is renewable energy. Uh, electric vehicle and also energy storage system. So renewable energy result in unstable energy supply. You can imagine unstable energy supply, how much pressure is going to put on the grid. So demand is uncertain, supply is uncertain. So we, we all know that in the, in the supply chain or in different uh, business contexts, it's this, uh, you have one side, <laughs> Uncertain is very difficult to deal with, and you have your own supply side, which is uncertain. So what we, there are many ways that we can, we can stabilize the system. Basically with, with a, a smart grid, we need to put sensors everywhere, knowing the consumption, knowing the power generation from renewable energy. Then with that, we can decide how we can utilize energy storage system so that 
we can stabilize, we have provide uh, sufficient electricity, but minimizing the pollution, minimizing pollution. That is, we want to minimize using traditional way or fossil-based energy uh, generation methods. We want to increase the use of um, renewable energy. However, we need to be able to stabilize or understand more about renewable energy generation. So sensor, with a sensor, we can decide, decide how we can utilize energy storage system coupled with the renewable energy so that they can, their generation can be stable and maximize and we can reduce the traditional way of energy generation. So smart grid is basically doing a lot of things, but this is probably on the infrastructure side, this is probably the most important part. Okay, allowing allowing we to understand all these things. Otherwise, you can imagine uh, every month somebody come to your home and say, "Okay, you have consumed certain certain uh, kilowatt hours of electricity." That would not be able to help too much. Now with the smart meters uh, at your home and they can know as frequent as they want how much electricity you can consume, consume or a factory consume. They can get all these models, build up their, their understanding of the demand, build up the prediction of the demand and couple with us so that they can better manage the, the grid. In the past, it was company, power company said, okay, tomorrow we're going to build, we are going to burn another uh, power generator and so that so that we can create this amount of electricity the only thing that we need to deal with is how to optimally distribute them to the customer now we are dealing with this very dynamic uh, 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 elect electricity grid so again iot is the infrastructure that facilitates this smart grid iot of course we have cloud we have Data analysis, but IoT infrastructure allow us to gather those data, analyze it, and with a lot of analysis method to cope with the uncertainty. So now we move to the, the topic of uh, IoT sensors, uh, or, well, basically, um, we sense a lot of data, we get a lot of data, we see the data, but we're not perceiving the, the, the information from the data. Uh, the, uh, the, maybe I, uh, the uh, most easiest un or understandable uh, example will be in the past, we saw pictures in the database, we can, However, we need to use human to label and say, okay, this is a my trip to somewhere and store it. And they say, mm, who are in the trip? You ask a computer, who are in the in the trip? Definitely the computer will not know that because the computer doesn't have the ability to identify the person and recognize the person in the past. The data is there, still there, but we don't really see what, what are in that picture. Recent AI uh, uh, evolution, um, well, basically I think the ultimate AI is just like human, the artificial, artificial intelligence. This, is, this intelligence based on our human's understanding Will be human intelligence. Okay, I think there should be something more intelligent than, than human. Then that's beyond what we can imagine. I we, we don't know that. But when we say that ultimate ultimate uh, AI, it is will, will be artificial like human intelligence, or we call it artificial general intelligence. Uh, right now we are at the stage we we, we can do narrow AI quite well. The big, biggest improvement is on the uh, uh, exploration of uh, our 
the brain science, a neural network, human brain, and how human brain, as, as we continue to understand how human brain passes information, we make the um, neural network more complicated, not like in the past. It is still weighted and uh, it's a, uh, uh, there's a network and there are different layers. Uh, you have weighted average of the information and getting some result doing classification. Uh, it was like that. But until we realized that if we can have a huge neural network, many layers, then we can really dissect the information to the fine detail so that in fact, we, it's, people call it a black box approach. Uh, I would argue otherwise. I feel that it is a tool that dissect the information at different scale, different resolution, so to speak. And having different layer of processing the information, for example, uh, the deep learning can allow a picture uh, uh, or a, uh, a pattern to be recognized invariant to its, its, its scale and its orientation, right? In the past, it was very difficult. In the past, it was very, very difficult. If you do a supervised learning, A is, this is A, when you lie it down, the system doesn't recognize this is A. Or if the system recognized my face, if I, I, I was sort of tilting my head, the system may not recognize it's me. Uh, there are different ways. Oh, then I, I do a different way. But every supervised learning has this very constrained way of recording the information, extracting the, the feature and recording this information. But for deep learning, it's unsupervised. Well, a little bit, a little bit of supervised, but basically unsupervised, just dissect the information, having these different layer of, of, of processing so that all the important features can be recorded into the system, the neural network. So it, for some people, uh, neural network uh, or uh, this neural network, deep learning can, can recognize information or can extract information. Uh, basically, neural network, uh, deep learning is a classifier. We can ask the neural network certain information and it will tell us whether or not there is such information. For example, uh, whether or not this picture, this is John or and a person, or how many people are they? Uh, basically, it will sort of identify the, these people. And, and help us. Oh, is, is this person? Uh, is this a person? Uh, a male or female classification? So basically, it's a classifier. But from a different perspective, I would also say that um, this deep learning tool is uh, a tool that helps us to to um, just like human to convert this unstructured data into structured data so that we can utilize, right? The picture has one uh, picture worth a thousand words. There are just lots of information, lots of description that we can have on the picture. Now the computer can help us do that. As long as we tra train the model, we use neural network, modeling after human brain, and the process, not just the structure, also the process of human brain so that uh, we can create this, uh, this stage of, of uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning. Under machine learning, there's this uh, artificial uh, deep learning. And there are more and more such kind of development which help us to analyze the data captured from the physical world. Remember in the physical world, data are analog data. Analog data, they are just like picture, video, sound, those data, analog data, they are not digital. Once we change them to digital, we need to extract the information out of the digital item. Right? In the physical world, if I hold a pen, 
is a pen. I cannot suddenly change it to something else. But in the di digital world, it's if you see my picture like this, I mean, there are just a lot of pixel there. It's not a physical item. There are just a lot of pixel. And suddenly these pixels need, need to be con connected together. And maybe uh, the, the system recognizes, oh, this is a ballpoint pen. Oh, this, uh, this, this there's a, 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 a function that you can, you can, you can uh, hide the, the tip of the, 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 uh, the pen and so on. All these, all these are can be can now be recognized by the system because of deep learning. And I think lots of lots of you know the uh, what happened with the Go game, right? Instead of training like exponentially possibility, they can also use the CNS. Ah, oh, okay, I should place my stone here because it's more likely that I will win. So they can learn from scratch. It doesn't need to follow the old logic of this total enumeration. They can just look based on their experience, based on their trend experiences. So they can play with each other and, and record the process. And then next time you look at the chessboard, it's, ah, okay, more likely if I put it here, it's more likely that I will gain more advantage. Right. That's how our brain process, and that's how uh, alpha go, alpha zero uh, process information. Very interesting. Um, so now we can easily, uh, still not that 100% easy, but it's a lot e easier than it was before. We can understand human emotion. Right? In the past, we said, oh, if the person left, the person need to show their teeth and mouth need to be wider, then it's laughing. Now we don't need to do that. We just say this person, because we can tell, human can tell, but the computer cannot tell. Then we tell, tell computer, oh, laughing. Oh, this is laughing. Oh, this mouth didn't know, still laughing. This, this mouth uh, open very wide, but this person is angry. We can tell, but the computer cannot tell. But as long as you tell the computer, what it is that you will learn. That's the, it's not magic, but it's, it feels like magic. I suddenly can, but it's, as I said, you think of the convolution process, you think of the layers and so on. You can know that it's basically dissecting the information, extracting all kinds of, of uh, uh, features at different resolutions and through learning, enhancing the, uh, the weighting of different features. And in the end, it builds out the knowledge of you with many layers of the details so that it can recognize you, recognize items, objects in the picture very quickly, okay? And we can, you probably know that a lot of logistic companies are tracking their driver's behavior, condition behavior already using computer vision. They also allow the vehicle driving on the street, watching that whether or not the driver is violating traffic regulation or helping the policeman to see there's a legal car parking there. There's a car not turning correctly. Uh, these are the projects that, that we have in, in Taipei city. Uh, there are companies doing that. A police uh, department is also doing that too. And other than picture, we can also do a uh, process video. Video is even, even more difficult. All the surveillance cameras until recently, it's just recording the information. And if they say, oh, there's a, there's a robbery somewhere, that's a fine where, where the person runs. Then they quickly say, okay, show, show us all the video. And then a human doing this human work is okay. It goes here and there. But now, in fact, we can ask the computer to track. To make it maybe simpler, you see there are a lot of 
people to the left, you see a lot of people there doing different things. Right? There are different, different uh, uh, open source libraries that allow you to do a lot of things. Right? You can use, uh, say, uh, uh, some uh, ULO to identify the, uh, the object. You can use uh, like open post or some other methods to identify the join and use different uh, algorithm to connect the join together to build out a skeleton of a person. And you can just track their, their body motion uh, in different ways, in a, a supervised way or unsupervised way. But basically you can learn from different videos what they are doing. And to the right is something that we have been doing, although we have pushed it to some degree. I wouldn't say that it's, uh, it's to our satisfaction yet, but we can track a worker, whether or not they are doing their self-cleaning process, uh, conforming to the standard operating procedure. They need to use the roller with sticker, like clean the, the body, clean hands, clean head clean back, clean feet, and so on. Before they can enter the clean room, they want to take out all the dust and hairs. In the past, there were a lot of problems. And they in here, in the picture, you see that they have security guard. You can imagine a security guard cannot check. And they, so, so we, we try to use a video to do that. It's, it's called activity recognition. And it has been done in many other applications. For example, for elderly care, is the elder uh, has uh, did, did the elder fall or the elder was just exercising? Uh, how much exercise did the elder did do during the day? Somebody need to do rehab, maybe not that accurately, but how many? actions that the person did. Are they dancing or are they fighting? Did the car make a, a U-turn illegally? It seems easy, but it's not. Did the car threaten the pedestrians trying to cross the street? If you use the picture, you say, oh, two of them. It's, it, on a certain uh, in, uh, picture, they are very close. So the car must be pressing the, the, the pedestrian, but it may not be the case. Maybe the car has already reached there. The pedestrian, pedestrian suddenly jump out of nowhere and the car stop allowing the, the pedestrian to go through. So, so some, some of the, the problem is continuous action with a single photo you cannot do. Tell the difference. So with video, you can get a, a lot of such kind of information. Oh, so you can do uh, traditionally voice recognition is also very very difficult. What, where do you cut and say, oh, this is the word we we compare. Oh yeah, you, you, this person is saying something because everybody speak with accent with different air falling out, but with deep learning. We also can easy translate uh, a, a voice, speech, speech to text. From text, we do natural language processing. So now we have a lot of uh, bots, right? Uh, computer bots, they provide service. You can talk to, to Siri, you can talk to Alexa, you can talk to other, other system, and they will communicate with you. Uh, their part is from text, to speech. Uh, before that, you talk to them. Uh, it was speech to text. Going to natural language processing, they understand what you want, basically retrieving information and converting this uh, information from text to speech and play to, to you. So they carry the uh, conversation with you with ease. And for smart retail, again, with AI, a lot of these uh, data analysis. Previously, I was talking about location. Here, I'm talking about using image to do analysis. 
And earlier I mentioned about energy efficient technology for building. So architectural improvement, ICT improvement, and human behavior. The latter two can all, can both, both of them can benefit from IoT. And this is also something that we, we, we developed. There are also a lot of uh, mature solution for so-called smart energy management for building, for example, for hospital, for retail, or for say campus. Right? Uh, there are a lot of things that you can do. And this is a project that we have, and we also had a paper on this, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, I think Indy maybe later can also explain this to you. It's water dispenser. We make it as make it turn it into a water service um, system and the water dispenser can learn how it is being used and reduce energy consumption and can provide the information to the user to um, to remind and help the user to manage their water drinking behavior and the water dispenser can communicate water dispenser and pull them together to provide services. And in manufacturing, we can also do something similar. Let me spend five more minutes, sorry. Oh, should I stop now? Uh, just but, okay, Professor, okay. maybe okay. five more minutes. Oh, give me, give me five more minutes. So, uh, uh, so, so traditionally, we use supervised learning. We do this uh, shifting detection. You can imagine, you need to give the, uh the, the 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 quality control system a box bounding box and so oh it's off they say uh defect defect but for human eyes is uh it's exceeding a boundary a little bit but it is okay but you cannot in like my description you cannot turn it into a function right you cannot do this there's no we want to do this uh, sort of supervised learning for the but the supervised learning basically give it a boundary. So this is a real case where they uh, inspect whether or not the uh, process have shifting effect. And um, in other research, they show similar improvement. Basically, uh, traditionally using traditional uh, automatic optical inspection, uh, this is just an example. They found more than 5,000 defects by the AOI. They found more than 5,000 defects by the AOI system, traditional AOI system. Then they found a lot of experienced worker and do man manual inspection. In the end, they found that there were only 200 some uh, out of spec uh, components. So they are using a lot of human to do the, 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 the uh, the inspection. So once they change it to um, to deep learning uh, way unsupervised, but they they train the system. So, okay, this word, this word, this word, this word, this word, this word. So the system learn. So the system then does the uh, inspection, and the number of uh, other spec part was reduced to five hundred some, and they still use human to do the uh, second check and found out that. Okay, there are probably 200 some other spec. So the work has been reduced to only 10%. This is a very, very popular example. And it has been shown in many different places. This is from a former student of mine. And, 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 and actually, um, because he worked for a company which, which uh, provide the system, the hardware machine. So he has a lot of data. He did analysis and found and, and establish such kind of improvement. Or we can combine AI with the system. AI identify defect. Here you see, AI identify the defect along the way. And with other guiding system, project the lights on the place which have spots need to be fixed. And worker just focus on, on these spots. Traditional worker will need to search very carefully whether or not there are problems. Oh, there's a problem, fix it, oh, following this project. But now worker, the, we don't need worker to do that search. We just need worker, their agility, 
their dexterity to fix the problem. So worker can only con can focus on fixing the problem. The process will be much faster and the uh, is is even an, uh, less likely to miss the the uh, defect parts on the surface. And we can do uh, earlier we men mentioned about predictive maintenance. And it has tremendous implication and impact on the effectiveness of the system. The machine breakdown will cause a lot of damage in different kinds of industry. And such kind of capability can allow us to build something called digital twin. Digital twin. Uh, and can also support something called outcome economy. We'll come back to this uh, in the future, okay? Digital twin, IoT data, collecting data, and map it to the uh, virtual model, and virtual model performs simulation, and maybe feedback information, or simulate the result, and decide how to cope with the problem, and feed the information back to the, say, manufacturing system, and to control the manufacturing system to react to the situation. And in healthcare, there are also a lot of examples. You can read them through. It's probably quite quite straightforward. Okay, I think I will just uh, stop here uh, for today, <laughs> so that uh, Indy can show a little bit of the uh, the demo, and then afterwards I can we can start the uh, question and answer session. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Xiu, for the very interesting presentation. Okay, now we will enter the next session. Maybe, Mr. Indy, would you like to give a demonstration regarding IoT application? Okay, thank you very much uh, for the time. Uh, actually, in this presentation, uh, some of our lab members will help me. Uh, let me introduce. The first one is uh, Rashid, Rashid Fajar. Rashid, can you open your camera? Yes. Okay. And also, please help to share the presentation, or maybe I will share the presentation. Okay. And the second presenter is uh, Julius. Uh, Julius. Uh, Hi. Okay. This is Julius. Both of them is the alumni alumnus of uh, ITS. Uh, Rashid is from was uh, studied from informatics engineering informatics now sorry informatics department and Julius from electronic right electronic or electrical uh, electronic ITS yeah, yeah. electronic electronic ITS okay uh, Rashid can you share or maybe I will share the presentation I can share it okay okay uh, can you see my screen okay. Okay. So in this presentation, we will expl explain about self-scanning procedure based on activity recognition. So in this research, we conduct uh, a research how to uh, recognize activity in the cleaning room because in some factory, that before you need to come to the cleaning room, uh, the, the room to doing assembly or something like what professor explained before, you need to have uh, some sweet and you need to clean yourself first. Okay. And then uh, usually this procedure is conduct by manually. So there is someone who doing some cleaning, right? cleaning their head, cleaning their hand, both hand, uh, their body and their foot. And then someone will check it. And then in this uh, research, we, we want to uh, have more automatic uh, checking system by using a combination of the computer vision for sure and then some uh, uh, real-time video then can uh, identify all the procedure in for the clean rooms uh, activity so for example that if you already doing some like cleaning head they will inform you that you already done the cleaning head. But maybe if you miss one 
uh, activity, they will also recognize that miss and then can inform you. And for this uh, kind of research, actually, we already developed from 2019. And then uh, we already have two kind of uh, way, two kind way for this research. First one is developed by our uh, student already graduate using mostly for the CNN and then combined with open post. Maybe Professor already explained a little bit about open post by using uh, to get the skeleton from the uh, human or from the person that we identify. And then the second one uh, using more uh, different kind, but using uh, not using the open post, but using a 3D CNN, or maybe we also hear about 3D ResNet. That's the combination of the uh, convolutional network network for the 3D part. In this one, it's also try to detect the tools that used for the cleaning the body. So not only from the activity or the movement, but also try to detect from the uh, the tools that use. Okay. So for the first one, uh, we'll explain by Julius, then uh, continue by Rashid. Okay, the time for Julius and Nasib, uh, please. Thank you, Mr. Indy, for the time. I think for the motivation is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's already explained by Professor Cho and Mr. Indy about the motivation of this research. We, are, we want to perform a supervise to some cleaning procedures, especially in a clean room. So uh, as you can see, there's a guard, a security guard there in a picture that will like uh, perform like uh, supervision to any employees who want to do the cleaning procedures. Basically, we want to replace that one and because it is not efficient, efficient to having a guard to do supervision for uh, cleaning procedures, we want to use like vision-based AI monitoring. Like we want to build a system where we can recognize human activity from a real-time video or CCTV. We also want to recognize each steps of the cleaning procedures. Okay, next slide. As therefore, as the highlight, the important things is we want to keep the dust away from the clean room and workers are as the main source of pollution should do certain cleaning procedures properly and the word properly is very important here so since it is not just something that we could uh, do the cleaning perfunctory but we really have to have the employees do the cleaning procedure correctly and for next slide so the scenario is as follow. The first, like uh, the employee will get, uh, uh, have to put all their stuff, uh, their personal items on the cabinet, and then they will come to a special room where they, they do the air shower to them. And then the third one is they have to wash their hand and dry their hand, put on glove, head mask, hazmat, and et cetera. And the fourth one is the dust cleaning procedures. This is the one that, uh, we want to do the supervision on to check the cleaning SOP here, the dust cleaning procedure. So they have to use like, uh, you know, like the lean remover, something like that to uh, clean all things in their, uh, in their outfit, in their hazmat uh, with a certain cleaning procedure. And then they, they have to wash and dry their hands again. And then they do the air shower again. And then, uh, the seven and eight, the eight one is the exit. So after they exit from the clean room. And next slide. This is one of the example of the cleaning procedure as you can see in the left uh, video. But the problem there, if you are noticing like uh, the worker didn't clean uh, his right hand properly. So that's why like uh, with this supervision or this uh, SOP uh, activity recognition, we also want to be able to know whether the, the worker or the employee do the, 
do the cleaning procedure correctly or not. And the proposed uh, action, action definition by our system is, uh, there are seven steps here. The first one is head cleaning. Second one is back hand, back head cleaning. And then the third one is left hand cleaning, right hand cleaning, the back cleaning, legs cleaning, and back legs cleaning. And next. So the objective of this research is, of course, to create an automation, automatic activity recognition system based on self-cleaning SOP from real-time video. So we want to uh, do activity recognition real time in that place then we can uh, detect many of the workers too and whether they do the cleaning procedure correctly and the system is created to ensure that every worker needs to do self-cleaning correctly before entering the clean room and so the company product will not be attached by a particle of dust and the limitation here is every worker must stand with a specific distance in front of the camera and only focus on a single object for motion prediction. But we want also uh, further improve this limitation so we can have uh, many like uh, much reliable model that we can have a different kind of environment and also can detect many of the workers at once. So it will be ineffective if you are only do the supervision for one worker, right? And then for the next slide. So the research idea here is uh, we want to be able to understand the action by the worker uh, via the video itself. So what type of human information should be used? And the question is uh, how to classify the different actions and how to measure the action completion. Like I said, is it done correctly or not? So based on that question and that problem, we use two kind of AI technique here. First is action recognition, and the second one is object detection. And for the next one, the proposed method, my friend Rashid will explain about what is the proposed method uh, of this approach. In our current research, uh, current, our current research proposed two methods. The first one is to focus more on activity recognition uh, with utilizing OpenPost, CNN, YOLO, LSTM, and Gmin's clustering. And the second method is combining activity recognition and object detection. And this method is using 3D CNN or convolutional neural network and YOLO. Uh, this figure is illustrating the outline of the first method. Uh, in each video, has there several posts that indicates the action. This method has also has several features. Uh, the example here, the temporal features. The the features is from kinetic skeleton that is detected by human body key points detection and the uh, special features video uh, and special fe features uh, from features and uh, we get this from features engineering from the kinetic skeleton and we also have the cnn features map uh, from the features extraction by a cnn model uh, from each frame in a video the kinetic skeleton of the human body is extracted as the temporal feature and then the kinetic skeletons are transformed to a three tra traversal scheme for the special features and then the special features and cnn feature map will be input for the training model by using lsdn This method is using LSTM as a classifier and CNN for obtaining the dynamic sliding window size. So we don't determine manually uh, the window size. And each frame will be collected into an activity video when there is a similarity of human posture from each frame. In general, 
the main ideas of this resource are to substitute a static sliding window with dynamic sliding window for real-time prediction and to combine the features extracted from human skeleton joints with the features extracted from CNN. This approach aims to explore more multi-model features. Afterward, a learning strategy is also performed in this work by grouping the motion features via k-means, clustering algorithm, and classifying via LSTM where it is effective to consider the temporal sequence information among the key poses. However, this approach will be much relying on CNN performance before taking the input into LSTM classifier. And this is the example of the first method. Uh, As we can see here, the motion class is cleaning head, while the person has done cleaning his head. And it will continue to the last action. This is the slide is for the second method. Uh, this method is using 3D CNN as the classifier for the action, action classification. An object detector to detect the stick or the sticky roller. Uh, we detect the stick to measure the completeness of the action. First, we need to in this method we need to pre-process the video. The pre-processing is making a one second length of video snippet from a full sequence video. So we cut a full sequence video into several uh, short snippets. And these snippets are the input for the 3D CNN to be classified. And the classification result uh, are the action segmentation of the video. So the model will know what is the person doing at the specific time. This resource to two required data set had been created to apply the model used in this resource. One was video for augmentation data set for building classifier. Uh, and the other was data set from extracted image from the raw video for building the object detector for the Stick. The cleaning action could be classified by extracting spatiotemporal features from the classifier, and the completeness of the actions, action was identifiable by detecting the location of the sticky roller crushed in hands. Uh, the location attribute of objects were adapted to model the detector. Each sample and frames produced multiple snippets and predicted the action category, followed by merging of successive snippets. Finally, the detector detect the detector detect the location of the object and calculate the distance between standard cleaning process and the detected objects to decide whether the action was performed accurately. And this is the, the video example. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot see the video here. But mostly, it's the same as the video before. Uh, as we can see here, the this is the the video. Uh, the video is segmented into several action categories. The blue bar here is the ground truth of the action class and the duration and the green bar is the prediction uh, it is the predicted action class and the duration so the model uh, is able to predict uh, the action in the specific time uh, and that's all in our 
demonstration. Uh, thank you. Maybe we can okay, continue. Okay, thank to... you very much, Rashid. Uh, maybe I will show the last video. Uh, let me share screen. Uh, Rashid, you can wait a while. Okay, so this is the second video. Actually, for this uh, research, at this moment, we only can uh, detect for uh, one person. But for the effectiveness of the system and effectiveness and efficiency, we should have like multiple person. We cannot have like one by one for sure. And then for this is the challenge for Rashid and Julius for their uh, thesis, their master thesis, how to, uh, one of the challenge, how to uh, detect by multiple object in here so uh, they can uh, detect like maybe two or three person together and then they can uh, identify all the correct or maybe all the miss uh, activity uh, performed by all the person in the uh, video okay okay thank you very much uh, maybe that's all for this uh, video if you have uh, any question we can uh, you can us during our question and answer with professor together okay thank you very much Rashid and Julius maybe you can still stay in here all right thank you very much for the opportunity thank you very much Mr. Indy Mr. Julius and Mr. Rashid for the interesting uh, demonstration and presentation regarding your developed application okay now we will enter the Q&A session Please, if you have any question, you can raise your hand and ask directly to the speaker, or you can write down your question in the chat box. Okay, while waiting for the question, I will ask a question actually from the previous session we have several questions that hasn't answered yet mm -hmm. so if i may uh, ask several of them which uh, i found one of them is interesting the question is from mr uh, mr michael christopher he asked with the development of the iot the unemployment rate will automatically increase because iot will replace many jobs how to overcome this because we all know that the unemployment rate is a serious problem mm -hmm. okay okay i think this is uh probably uh, uh the same question when whenever there's a new technology was introduced uh fortunately uh, from the first second and third uh, industrial revolution after that we were able to come up with uh more more work to uh, for the the jobs displaced uh, job. I think that the, the point is uh, we are very uh, used to the current environment and we feel that that's the normal situation and um, and we should uh, try to maintain the normal um, situation. But if we think of it, um, I think most of the current jobs, um, if, you, if you think of it, uh, in fact, uh, after the uh, Industrial Revolution, uh, let me see, I couldn't remember what, when, but then uh, I think it's in the uh, uh, in UK and in, I don't remember the, the, the city, very close to uh, Nottingham. Uh, basically, they suddenly realized, hey, where are they having people working from home? We gather them together working together, then it will be more efficient. So they created a factory, but the factory for many years wasn't a, a good term. It's, uh, it's, it's a very infamous because they just abuse uh, people in the factory and so on. Um, my point here is, in fact, human as human, um, 
or in, in terms of the human jobs, uh, if the machine, as you say, simple machine can do better, I would argue that those are jobs for machine, not for human. I think in, in, our, in the world that there are a lot of things related to human, which are not being uh, taken care because we need to work on a certain job to keep things going. If we can be free from those jobs, then we can spend time on taking care of people, caring more about disadvantaged people, caring, uh, caring uh, people having, say, um, emotional problem, uh, helping people to get healthier and so on. Uh, I think those jobs uh, may not exist, but if you think of it, those jobs should be equally valuable than uh, valuable to the, uh, the, the job that, that, that we are afraid to be taken over by machines. But those jobs, like, do you really want to do work like punch a car, like machine, eight hours a day? Or do you really want to exhaust yourself thinking, oh, this will go wrong, this will go wrong, and just doing that to keep things moving? If the machine can do that, I think it's better off that we let the machine do it. But of course, the problem will be what should human do? I think this will be, this is not a uh, technical problem. It's a social problem. It's a political problem, policy problem. Uh, you know that there were people proposing that in the future, if a company making products with robots and AI, we should tax them. At first you think, why? I mean, they can do that. Tax for what? Taxing this is based on a, a very social idea, meaning that uh, basically now of us create value and enjoy value by ourselves is contribution of a lot of other people. So we shouldn't ignore other people's contribution. So if you are using machines and just creating because you can and creating value for yourself and others do not have job, others, uh, our economy cannot sustain, then that needs to be changed. So they can take this, these people and okay, we don't need to have many people working on the jobs, but these people can do more meaningful job but they need to get paid. So the money should flow to these people, allowing them to do, do their job there. I think it's still something that needs to be changed. I understand people's fear. I mean, I'm afraid of myself losing my job. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, a lot of people say, oh, maybe professor's job will not be replaced that quickly. But a lot of jobs will be replaced uh, very quickly for sure. Um, but, uh, as I said, uh, even for a professor, if we are just doing jobs that a machine can do, for example, I would tape something, put it on the video and somebody can speak better and just, everybody can just watch that video. Then I think we will lose our job too. So that, that is something that we need to think about. But I, I think I, I would uh, prefer to think of it in a more positive way. Uh, as a professor, I think uh, here we have quite a few <laughs> uh, professors here, I think, at least I enjoy my mind being free, being able to think of things, being able to create and being able to educate, helping, helping students or, or focusing on a certain topic and, and making, uh, hopefully making a society be better. I enjoy this kind of, of life I and mean, I got paid. So I guess I'm very lucky that I can do that. But I think more jobs should be like that, creating value to the human rather than just creating economic value. And those economic value can in fact be created by machines. So there's a social structure that would, the policy not need to be changed. Okay, I think for industry 4.0, you'll bring out this question. And I think this week, if somebody has question, maybe this person will say that, hey, AI is going to take over our job. What should we do? Then we do something that AI cannot do. <laughs> Hopefully, I don't have an answer here because it, it is um, 
it, it is a very good question, very basic question that we need to face. I'm just uh, pointing out that there may be a direction and I can, for sure, I, I use the history as an example. I first industrial revolution said that, oh no, machine take over human job, human will not have job. And second industrial revolution, oh, machine taking over human job, human will not have jobs. And the third industrial revolution, even with automation, it's all oh, machines go taking over human jobs, human will not have job, but human continue to find jobs, maybe more meaningful jobs, hopefully more meaningful jobs. We don't really want to spend that much time working and cannot um, enjoy our life or living like a human. We want to minimize that. But how does the economy accelerate? Uh, if very few people or very few machines can create all the tangible things that we need, then we are free for, to do other things. Hopefully by then people value music, value arts, value care, right? all these things uh, much better because they don't need to worry about these uh, mundane, thing, mundane things. Right? I have food, I, I can transport. And I want to spend more time with my family. I, I want to do other things. Hopefully that, that can become reality. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Joe, for your answer. <laughs> okay, is there any question from the audience? And maybe I can comment on the uh, application again. So that shows that uh, with sensor, which is a camera, capturing data, originally we cannot really utilize data. As I said, whenever there's a video, it is like very passive. Oh, something wrong. Let's go back to the video. I check who did not clean themselves well. Maybe this guy uh, co caused the problem. But now with the video, before they enter the clean room, we have the information already. If this person did not clean himself or herself, uh, he or she will not be allowed to enter the clean room. Right? We can prevent this thing from happening right then afterwards. Oh, oh, that's, and we still need to have human to check on the video and very difficult, very time consuming. Right? So uh, that's uh, the point of this demonstration. Like with IoT, some data are structured data we can analyze directly. But uh, although we, we, all, we all have tools, I mean, uh, like Indy uh, has been with us for some time, we have gone through a lot of application. We know that even though tools there, but in order to use the tool well, or in order to um, really explore the, the power of the tool, in fact, experiences, knowledge is still very important. Really then, oh, yeah, we, we, we have TensorFlow, we have Keras, we can, everybody can do it. It's not, it's uh, still uh, based on your understanding of the tool and your experience, the inside of using the tool so that the result can be improved. I guess that's also the point of their de demo. <laughs> like, okay, thank you, Prof. Jo. Is sure. there any question? Okay, if there is no question, maybe I will ask Prof. Jo, if I may. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Uh, you already, Prof. Jo already explained regarding a lot of development hmm. that is open for AI application. However, uh, may I say that most of the development is driven by data. So, uh, in yeah, right now, we have a problem regarding data privacy. Or also, and also the ethics of AI application mm -hmm. in real life. For example, like we actually already have so many development in the medical uh, section using AI. However, we still cannot apply them because we have an issue with the ethics. For example, like if for if we create an AI program that can detect. Uh, this is then if the machine give a wrong analysis, give a wrong uh, detection regarding a patient, 
Mm. And then who will have, yeah, who will need to, uh, who will be responsible for that mistakes. Mm. Mm. Nah, so uh, I want to ask, what is your, what is Prof. Joe opinion regarding this? Mm, okay. Uh, yeah, excellent question. And uh, having many points about about AI. I think ethics in, in AI is or is definitely uh, some something that uh, prevent uh, a lot of further developments. Uh, as you mentioned, that uh, who should be responsible? Like AI, uh, AI is a human. People designing AI or people using the AI, right? um, and it will cause a lot of potential problems. For example, if I create a car, I said you sit on the car, my car will not danger you. So whoever causing a problem will just run over the person. So we have a safe car. <laughs> the other person, the other car company may say that oh we have ethic. If that child, then we will try to hit the car and damage the car. And you are lucky. You, you, you won't get injured, but for the ethic purpose, we cannot run over a kid. Then nobody bought the car. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, it's something uh, I, I think uh, human uh, have the tendency of forgive themselves human, but a human cannot forgive machine or other adjectives. So unless the machine is perfect, then we, we may not be able to, to use them. A human make me take me say all the time. So if the AI cannot reach certain level, I think a lot of um, application will not be adapted. That's uh, maybe uh, not exactly towards your question, but uh, that's just a quick comment. There's in under IEEE, there's a, a committee on ethics in AI and robotics. So they are exploring a lot of such kind of issues. Maybe you can also follow up their, their uh, discussion. Uh, for, uh, first of all, the AI should not harm human uh, and so on. But another problem with AI, particularly with deep learning is um, we don't really know how, how it, I mean, we don't even know how we reach some conclusion, right? So how would you know that the AI will not decide to destroy the world so that they can, <laughs> they can run the world? You say, hmm, it's not possible, right? It's, uh, it's just, uh, a robot, we don't really know. We don't really know why, how they will make their decision. So there's also a, um, a movement uh, yeah, that they are called explainable AI, particularly for the def defense industry. They, when they use the AI, they want to understand the way that AI derived their solution. I mean, you, so neural network, okay, just tell, tell me, the AI will not get crazy, uh, press the button. <laughs> And initiate the world, a uh, world war, world war. We don't know. So there are also a lot of uh, development in this regard, trying to understand the process and make sure that it's safe. You will not do something. It doesn't have life. It, it doesn't care, right? Then how do we know that AI will not want to destroy the world so that the world will be more peaceful? So that's uh, about the AI. But you, when you talk about data privacy, which is um, also a very interesting topic, but there's also an issue on data ownership. These are more practical issues rather than the AI ethic issue. Um, data privacy, of course, we all treasure our privacy. Um, um, for, the, for, for, for different purposes. Uh, one is, is my data, right? If I don't want it, you shouldn't, you don't need to know. That's about data ownership. If you think of it, it's about data ownership. Another part of privacy is maybe somebody will take my personal information and create something to my disadvantage. For example, I'm yield, or um, maybe I can't, cannot do, uh, uh, for example, I'm, I'm, I sort of, I, I'm ill, and you go to the, um, the company to find a job. They decide, they said, they have the information. They don't want to give you a job. So if such kind of things happen, then, oh, okay. So the world will be more, be more competitive, but a lot of people will be discriminated for different reasons that we don't want them to happen, right? And people 
make that decision can can totally can say that oh no it's not for that reason it's for other reason but in fact it's because that they know the data and that was their decision so so the privacy issue are in these two regard one is protect people so that others or companies cannot put them in this effect in a disadvantage uh, position because it should be fair to some extent. Uh, the other is it's just your data, your ownership, right? Um, however, privacy thing um, is also something created in the industrial age. Right? You, you just think of the uh, agricultural uh, period where you have house, you you have village, everybody knows everybody else, right? The husband and wife have a fight yesterday or whatever things everybody knows like there's no this this fear or threat or exposing such kind of information until the industrial age i just heard which i cannot confirm denmark allowed the government or allow agency to to get a lot of personal data i uh i'm not 100 sure because it's totally against uh GDPR, General Data Protection Re Regulation, is also also uh, EU um, discreet on uh, privacy, data privacy. But Denmark basically go in a different direction. So who care, right? We will let you know, know the, the data. I'm not sure whether that's true. I just read uh, a few days ago, and I, I, I suspect uh, I don't understand the purpose. Right. So maybe. Danish are not afraid of the government. The government will not do something that harm them. So, uh, so they, they they say okay, get the data. I mean, make my make make my make my life better. I'm willing to give you the data. Okay, that's possibility if we can ensure that. Because if we don't want to provide our data, we don't want our health data provided to, to other people. We don't want all these data to and. This data-driven approach will not work because they don't have data. But we are afraid of them abusing the data. And that is exactly what exactly happened, as you put it, because there's a data ownership problem. Those companies, although I just glorified them and say that, oh, they have large uh, market cap in the world, they are making a lot of money. But in, in fact, they are abusing their, their, their their privilege of getting our data. And they just utilize data, continue to profit from our data, and we have nothing to say about it. So globally, there's also this very important movement, which is about the digital sovereignty. Maybe later I'll touch upon that a little bit, but the digital sovereignty, a country need to have its digital sovereignty so that online company cannot just enter your your, your, your country and taking all the citizen data away and not returning any value to your citizen. I think that's very important because for domestic company, you need to build out your competitiveness based on your understanding of the customer. But now your data have already been taken by company from other countries and they are enjoying the advantage of knowing the country. The, the people in say Indonesia or in Taiwan and your innovation, which is smaller, just like Taiwan, comparing with those big companies in the West, I'm not saying anything uh, in other, I mean, basically it's very difficult to protect your domestic industry. Uh, your in innovation will be killed or be, will be taken over then just put, it, put them aside because they can, continue to compete. As I showed just now with uh, Amazon's case, they, they know the customer so well that I cannot just set up an online company selling things and, and try to have to profit or try to compete with Amazon because they know their customers way, way too much, way too well, how Amazon built out the AI because they have so much customer information. I they have so much government, Facebook, no, claim that they, are, they know you better than you do yourself, right? They know who is your real friend, who is not your real, real friend, all these very scary things. So, so 
data ownership in Taiwan, there's a there's a National De Development Council is also focusing on data ownership. We want our data driven economy or data economy can continue to grow and prosper. But then we need to do something. Otherwise, we don't have the digital sovereignty. We don't, we cannot compete. Okay, so this is also something that that need to be addressed. Um, I think uh, maybe just a side information, uh, a friend of mine, I think uh, Indy also know, uh, Professor Ben Koo, he is currently in Bali Island. Uh, he is he's from Beijing Tsinghua University. He's a Taiwanese, but work for Pe Peking Tsinghua University. He, he has been there developing something in this regard. So in uh, G20 this year, maybe you will see something developed by him. And we are, we are also working with him and trying to contribute uh, a little bit of his work. So, so um, maybe in originally I planned to go to Bali Island in June, but, but uh, now I may postpone it to, to July, but I will go to Bali Island to join him discussing um, what other things we can do in this regard. Basically, allowing to work within your own bubble getting information or interfacing information with the outside world, protecting your ownership of your data. But you can also provide those data maybe at a cost, right? Some company can get it, but you can provide to other people because these are your data. That's why Australia, say South Korea, has have so much dispute with Google or Facebook, these companies. They basically say that whatever data you take from our citizen, you need, on their request, you have to provide them in a readable form, in a readable form. So that's also very important. Okay. Okay, thank you, know, you very much. It's important for, 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 because it's, it's, I have a lot of opinion on this. Yeah. <laughs> but then um, I guess uh, in the interest of time, I'll just stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Jo, from the very elaborate explanation <laughs> regarding the topic. Um, yep. Okay, Mr. Mujahideen, do you have any question or any suggestion, probably, Pak Mujia? Pak <laughs> uh, um, Mujia masih di mute. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I just want to say to Prof. Jo, thank you, Prof. Jo. Uh, hopefully, Prof. Chu always help and collaboration with our department. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, Prof. Chu. <laughs> oh, welcome. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is such an interesting and insightful presentation from Prof. Chu and his lab members. But unfortunately, the time is running out and we must end our discussion today. But before we end it, I want to make a Simple summary about today's topic. Actually, I quote some of Prof. Joe's <laughs> uh, sentence in the lecture. First is, by using data, machine or sensor, and connectivity, we actually can generate more analysis to make more business models, and it can be used to perform activity more effectively. And then second, because this topic is about IT-enabled service, actually, IT, IoT, Infrastructure allow us to obtain more data and help us to deal with uncertainty. Okay. And then on behalf uh, of the programs committee, I would like to say thank you to our honored speaker. Thank you very much, Prof. Jo and Mr. Indy, Mr. Rashid, and Mr. Julius for sharing your experience and expertise regarding this topic. And I would also like to apologize if there are any mistakes in conducting today's session. Uh, let's meet again on the next adjunct professor session on the Thursday, 19 May, with topic data integrity to innovative to innovative business model. Mm -hmm. But before we end this event, let's take a picture together. Please turn on your camera, please. Please turn on your camera. We will have a photo session.
Okay, I will take a picture. One, two, three. On the next slide, one, two, three. Okay, thank you very much. See you next week. Thank okay. you, Prof. Show, Mr. Indy. Thank you, Prof. Show, Mr. Indy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Indy, Rosie, and yeah, Julius. Thank you, Julius. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. See you. You can leave first, bro. Okay, bye. Bye. Terima kasih Mbak Mbak Raras.